Gina Kunarian is a women's sobriety coach committed to helping women overcome alcohol dependency. Through her podcast, Shine Within, she offers insights for achieving confidence, clarity, and vitality. Drawing on her own victory over alcoholism, Gina developed the Transformation Shine process to guide others towards sobriety and self-discovery. Gina, welcome to the show. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much, Brad. It's a pleasure being on your show. I'm super excited. And yes, I can't wait to discuss what uh, we're going to discuss today. Wonderful. Perhaps you could share a little bit about your story and what led you to here where we are today. Oh my goodness. Well, I wish my story was all magical with smiley faces and joy and love, <laughs> but it was quite the opposite. I definitely had a horrible childhood. My mom was loving, you know, I give her that. She was very loving and she noticed uh, because my father had passed away when I was a baby that as I was a six-year-old little girl, five-year-old little girl, drawing pictures and I was drawing pictures of my mom uh, someone, whatever would be of a guy, father figure, right? And then myself. And so with that, she's like, well, maybe I should start meeting people, you know? So she did with good intentions. However, the person that she found in her life wound up becoming a child molester. And so from the ages of six to 12 years old, I was touched in ways that I didn't know what kind of touch that was. Was this supposed to be love? What, what, what am I supposed to do with this? I was very confused as a girl. And with that, I had very low so, uh, so, self-confidence, low self-esteem, low self-worth. I really didn't like myself growing up. So I chose all the wrong friends. Of course, I chose all the wrong relationships in high school. But what I did is I really wanted to just venture out into this world that I thought was going to be awesome by partying and drinking and drugs. And what I found is more of an acceptance in that world, whether it's, you know, going out to partying, to raves, where it was like that love culture, or going out and drinking alcohol and everyone's vibing off each other's energy. I felt mostly accepted there. So what happened is I went ahead and started drinking heavily, um, wound up meeting my my soon-to-be DJ husband, and we both, two unhealthy people, of course, with my childhood trauma that I had experienced and with him, with his codependency and also addiction, uh, his past addictions from methamphetamines, we decided still to get married to have a happy happy marriage, right? Well, no, um, my, my social drinking went into habitual drinking, then to dependency. And with that dependency, I there was a monster inside me. I started becoming very aggressive with my behavior. I was hitting, I was throwing, I was being manipulative. I was being very aggressive. And it wasn't then until he, because we already had a child together, that he decided one day that he wasn't going to come home because of my uh, irrational behavior. So with my irrational behavior, and this is including me throwing things outside of the house of his, in my delusional mind, I thought he was cheating on me, which he was not. All of these made up stories in my mind, and I just wanted to act upon them. And I did. Well, that that got me into not having my son and then also ruining my marriage. And I was very sad and alone during that time. And I remember I was thinking to myself, oh my goodness, I don't want to live anymore. Like this is this is horrible. I hate this empty, hollow, disgusting feeling inside. So I was texting my friend at the time and I was like, you know what? I don't care if I live or die. I'm going to take all this Ativan because I was also diagnosed with like anxiety and depression and all that stuff. And um, I'm going to go ahead and drink and I don't care if I wake up. Well, he took that serious and he called my parents who, well, my mom's remarried, by the way, <laughs> he got rid of that guy and my stepdad, bless his heart, love him to death, um, called my parents and they went ahead and called, of course, 911, which then I was awoken to paramedics coming inside my home, taking me out, taking me to the hospital, pumped my stomach. And then I was there. My doctor at the time was next to me, next to my bedside. And he was like, I am so glad you're okay. We were really worried about you. Um, you need to get the help that you need to get the help uh, with some uh, an outpatient program that I was going to go ahead and do. But I wound up being an inpatient. And then with inpatient, I went ahead and stayed there for three days. After three days, went to outpatient where I thought I was then learning more about anger issues, how to manage my anxiety, still not claiming that I was an alcoholic because I thought I just had a high tolerance at the time. 
Well, it wasn't until one counselor went ahead and told me, um, Gina, do you drink or do any drug narcotics or anything? And I said, nope, I not, I don't drink. <laughs> totally lying to her. Of course I was drinking, but I was very shameful and I felt guilt inside. I didn't want that side of me to be revealed, in other words. And so here I was taking this outpatient program, it was like several months or so, and here I was like, oh, I'm doing great. Well, in 2014, uh, I was in Thanksgiving, my mom decided to take me to my brother's house, and I realized that I didn't bring any alcohol with me, and I started getting very shaky, very clammy, and it felt so sick. Like, I never felt like this before because I'm used to drinking alcohol. Mind you, Brad, I was drinking a fifth of vodka a day in order me to function, in order for me to drive, in order for me to go to work, in order for me to live. I needed that amount of alcohol for me to just do everyday activities. Well, so my mom, bless her heart, brings a little small glass of wine to me and she's like, here you go, just drink this and you should be fine. And I'm like, oh no, mom, I, you don't understand. I need more than that. And she's like, huh? And this was the first time I had then admitted that I was an alcoholic. I didn't realize how sick I was becoming without the alcohol in my system. And so immediately I checked myself into rehab a month later. And so in December, and I stayed there for 30 days. 30 days was great. I met so many people that were just like me, you know, full of issues. And so we were all together trying to get better. And of course, I was sober for those 30 days, seeing the counselors there and going to these support groups, even having AA meetings that were facilitated inside the center. Well, I graduated, so to, so to speak. And then what do I do right afterward? I go straight to the casino that was only about 20 minutes away. I met with an old fling of mine that actually was a good friend of mine in college. And I said, let's go out and drink. We'll have fun. We did. <laughs> so here I was because I thought I could handle being uh, okay with drinking and stopping whenever I want to. No, it's not the case. Well, that year I wound up getting pregnant by his child and I wound up stopping during that time of pregnancy. And then he and I decided to try to make things work to see how it be like living together. You know, I've known him for so many years. So why not? So I did. And then um, I had a horrific experience with that birth. I almost lost my son and I almost died myself because of um, like my, my, what happened? I started hemorrhaging because I was induced because I had gestational diabetes. They didn't want the baby to grow too big inside me. So they wanted him to come out a little bit earlier. Well, that caused him to have hypoxia and for me to hemorrhage and have an emergency C-section. And it was a horrific experience, but you know, he's okay now. He's eight. <laughs> so wow. He's, he's good now. He's good. <laughs> oh, thank you. And so, but the, what I noticed is that once my baby after nursing, he got onto the bottle. Well, so did I, I got back onto mine. And I started drinking again, but then the behaviors, the relapse, the, everything was becoming worse and worse. And I was starting to pick fights again. I was becoming delusional again. I'm like, what gives? And so what happened is I one day was crying, bawling, like in my car, cause I knew I didn't want to live like this anymore. Like here, I'm going to lose two. I've already lost my first son practically. And then my second son here, he's going to take him away because he did call the cops on me one time. And good for him, you know, <laughs> good for him. And I was just like, God, you know, if there's one, please help me. I cannot do this alone. I do not want to live like this anymore. And sure enough, two weeks later, there was a blessing in disguise. I had pancreatitis, the most excruciating pain I've ever experienced besides labor in my life. And I was hospitalized for about a week or so. No visitors, no nothing. It was me my spirit and God, it was just us. We were there. <laughs> and then the doctor told me, and she was very serious speaking to me. She's like, Gina, if you don't quit within 10 years, you are going to die. And then immediately I had like all of these flashbacks, like, like everything that had happened and thought about my children. I saw my two boys in my head and I'm like, oh, I don't want to, why, what, how selfish can I be? Like, what kind of mom am I? Like, I, they only have one mother. I need to live not only for myself, but for them, if anything, you know? So I really did some self-evaluation. 
I was like, you know what? That's it. I was even prayed over the chap because there was a chaplain. There was a faith-based hospital, believe it or not. And then I was prayed over. And then I really had some time by myself, really thinking about everything. And that was the moment I decided in 2017 in September that I was no longer going to drink alcohol. So when I was released to the hospital from the hospital, went home because I lived by myself because of the situation that had happened before. There was a bottle of vodka waiting for me. What do I do this time? I threw it away. <laughs> it's like, you know what? I'm done. Let me change my life because I feel like there's a higher, div there's a divine out there that loves me more than I love myself. I need to re redo my whole life and transform. So that's what I did. I started doing volunteer work. I started going to a uh, church because I wanted to discover like, what is church? What is all this stuff? Because I never grew up spiritual or religious. And I just wanted that community and I wanted to hang out with the people that were like-minded, who wanted to grow in life and who wanted to do well. And so I was in a women's Bible study and I was doing this um, MLM uh, for health business. I wanted to get my health in gear as well. And then I... I did it. I had them pray for me. These ladies, I said, just pray for my health business. I really want to do well in this. That I'm brand new to it because this was like during like COVID time when no one was doing anything. Everything was like remote. So I, uh, I was pray. They, we prayed together. And then sure enough, the, one of the ladies like, you know what, since you're a female entrepreneur, you should check out my friend's master class. I said, okay, what is it? She loves business coaching, but she will help you with your business. I'm like, really? So I went on to the master class after master class and I really fell in love. And one segment that they had us do was like an assignment. They said, okay, I want you to become vulnerable and tell your story in like a two minute video. And so I was like, oh my goodness, can I tell my story? Can I'm so, I'm so scared. I can't, I can't because everyone's going to judge me or think less of me. I can't, you know what I said, but this is exactly what I need to do. I need to get uncomfortable because I was always stuck in this comfort zone. Why don't I step out of the box and just do something that I normally don't do? So I did. And then I did that video. And sure enough, that video got me a, a whole scholarship to that program. And that's what started my whole business because <laughs> I started learning about business coaching. I found out my, what, what, what my niche is, all these great things. And so now I'm happy helping other women discover who they are as a spiritual being and helping them recover and break chains from the alcohol addiction that they've been so stuck with and just to live a better life because everyone deserves a better life. So yeah, <laughs> I'm probably went on a tangent, but <laughs> No, not at all. That was, uh, thank you for sharing. And uh, do you think women are underrepresented when it comes to alcoholism statistics and so forth? Because, you know, a lot of people associate old men who sit all day at the pub as being those most likely to be alcoholics. But uh, as you said, it can happen at any point in life and particularly if you've had some trauma in, in youth. Yes, that's a great question. So to statistically, men are known to drink way more than the women, but I think women kind of hide it more. Like, you know, as a binge eater, women are sometimes will go in the closet and eat those chocolates. The same thing with alcohol. They will just keep it a secret because they don't want to be known as like, you know, less of a mother, less of a, a, a daughter or a, a wife or anything. So they will hide it. I've noticed um, not only speaking of experience, but stories women tell me about why they hid alcohol from other family and friends, because family and friends are whoever you hang around with and surround yourself with is very important. Because for me, like I told you, I come from a background of partying and trying to living this la la land lifestyle that really was superficial was not really a reality it was like my made up reality and sticking with those people i i would i drank with them but then once i was trying to get better and was trying to not have them hang out with me as much because I wanted to get better. I would like secretly drink on my own. So you know it's all part of the process like the whole the whole process is not like it's not linear. There's going to be relapses. There's going to be hiccups. But for you to go ahead and give yourself grace, like, okay, this is part of the process, then it's okay. But to answer your question, yes, <laughs> women tend to kind of hide. And there's not much of a percentage of women that are um, will come out and say, hey, I, I drink alcohol. I mean, you have those mommy wine days, you know, <laughs> 
or after work they go to drink wine or you know the girls night out they'll have like wine so <laughs> yeah mm, yeah do you think that uh it took a major health event i.e pancreatitis for you to actually wake up to the the damage that this was potentially causing Yes, it was really uh, because I, I asked, I surrendered. That right there, I that created that pancreatitis. I'd say, <laughs> and then that was the wake up call. It did have to take something like that in order for me to wake up. For someone, a professional, a doctor, be, look me in the eye and was very serious at the time, telling me you're going to die. I mean, she wasn't nice about it. She was like scolding me. And perhaps that's exactly what I needed at the moment because I wasn't listening to anybody. I wouldn't listen to my to some of my friends who were trying to get me on the right path. I wasn't listening to my mom or my siblings. You know, I wasn't listening to anybody. I wasn't even listening to myself. I, so it really took her to let me know, like, your health is in, in danger. You don't jeopardize it. Go ahead and do something about it, get healthier, change your habits, and just be who you truly are, minus the alcohol. Minus the alcohol. Yeah, I, one definition of happiness that I've heard is happiness is a temporary relief from suffering. And I think it's, alcohol can certainly assist with that, right? Uh, the party scene, raves, everything that goes along with that. Uh, it can certainly provide that temporary relief from suffering. How do people know when it's actually a problem, when, they're, when their behaviors are a problem? Because in the midst of that, you, you can think that you're actually having a pretty good time, except for the come downs and the hangovers and so forth, which gradually get worse as you get older. But mm -hmm. uh, for someone who's in the midst of that thinking, I'm just having fun, or any tips for having a reality check before it becomes a major health event? Right. So if you're questioning the drink <laughs> and saying, oh, am, am I drinking too much? Take a look at that. Observe it and really question, why are you drinking? Is it because you're trying to mask something that's underlying inside you, that's bothering, that's hurting you inside? Or is it because everybody else is drinking that's, that are your friends? Like say, for example, because we just had Super Bowl <laughs> the other day, right? Um, yeah. because everyone else is drinking and it's more like an influential thing, or is it because you really enjoy the taste of like a sip of wine or something, <laughs> which I, which I wish it was, only, it was my case. I wish I was able to like enjoy a glass of wine and just have one, but it wasn't like that. So you really want to take a look and observe why are you taking a drink? And if you feel like you're drinking too much, really take a look at that. You mentioned surrender. And I think that's an important concept. Uh, what's the role of spirituality and faith in recovery? Wow. So that's the one that's big game changer for me. Like that's what I really, really feel in my heart that has guided me to where I am now. I feel like I'm being divinely guided every day and I'm not all religious, you know, <laughs> but I'm definitely spiritual because I've my God in my heart um, is guiding me, you know, whether you can call it universe, God, source, whatever you want to call it, it's all the same, but it's that higher being more than yourself that loves you so much. And once you feel that and you, you know it, then you want to explore everything about it. And you, you'll notice that just naturally you'll start doing that kind acts. Like, where is this coming from? I never used to do these things before. Like serving and just, what I mean serving is like, I love doing children's ministry. I enjoy doing street ministry, having conversations with the homeless that are out on the streets. Not just because I'm like, oh, by the way, you need to follow these guidelines in the Bible. No, I wanted to really connect and have a conversation with them because they're human beings that don't get that connection from anybody because they're looked down upon and that's not right. So I wanted to do different things. I felt that brought joy inside my heart. And I noticed the more time, the more things I was doing that brought so much joy, I felt closer to the divine. I felt closer to God. And I literally am realizing I'm this is probably a different podcast, but I'm becoming more intuitive and more in tuned into my own gifts, uh, whether I'm uh, um, 
clairaudient or whatever, <laughs> or have a gift of knowing. And I'm really discovering, wow, there's so much a human being can do. <laughs> and there is no limit. There is no limit. Mm. I like that idea of tuning into your intuition. And uh, I guess feeling that you're part of something larger than yourself certainly helps you not feel alone because a lot of people who are caught in the cycles of addiction generally feel quite lonely. Uh, I, that's from my own experience. Yes, I felt so alone. And, you know, I talked so bad to myself. Like I would say, oh, why are you doing that? You're so stupid, Gina. Why would you do something so dumb like that? Oh, you know, he's not going to talk to you. He doesn't like you. He hates you. Like this negative dialogue in my head. And I'm like, you know what? I don't always have to believe what my mind is telling me. As soon as I figured out I don't have to believe what my mind is telling me, that it's all made up, done. Like, let me reframe my thoughts here. You know, let me start talking differently to myself. And let me see if I go down this path of talking differently to myself, reframing my thoughts, telling my story differently. Let's see how this works. And it, it works. <laughs> Your confidence just boosts. You feel so much joy, you know, and the confidence is like not in an arrogant way saying, oh, I'm all that or anything. Because no, no. <laughs> It's like, no, I have so much confidence that I have a lot of love to give. And I just want everyone to experience what I am experiencing. And it's the, the potential is there. Everyone has it. Mm -hmm. My favorite definition of confidence is trust in yourself, which is yeah. that's the that's that transformation, I suppose, where you finally say, actually, I trust myself. I, I can do this. And then everything else has a ripple effect. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. And you'll see, yeah. Trust yourself. It's so true. Like that, that inner voice, the kind one, the nice one that, uh, is speaking mm. to you. The negative one is like the enemy. I said, you know what? I don't entertain those thoughts in my head. I, I always, if there's something that's negative out there, like I don't watch the news anymore. I don't read the newspaper anymore. If someone would ask me, what are the world events going on? Like, you know what? I don't know because it's not part of like where I am, the news that I would pay attention to is like, what's happening across the street from where I'm living? <laughs> is everything safe there? <laughs> you know, um, yeah. but I don't like to entertain those thoughts in my head, negative thoughts in my head. For sure. Tell me about integrating holistic health practices, diet, exercise, uh, mindfulness, and so forth as a way to sustain sobriety. How important are those practices? Oh, the mind, body, and spirit is so important. I have a background in massage therapy, and I went to the National Holistic Institute over here in San Jose, California, and I just learned so much about touch, breath, massage, body work, everything. And um, I've been at the Four Seasons now 17 years at the hotels as a spa technician working at the um, in the spa department. And what I've, I've experienced, like even people who have come in there, you know, a little bit on, I don't, I don't want to say narcotic, let's just say alcohol, because you can clearly smell it on, on their breath. Yeah. And something's and going I, on. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they just kind of like talk to you about certain things and you're just like trying to you know, work on them. But you really, I'm trying to give them energy work, like a Reiki, you're trying to give them more of a grounding, grounding feeling so that they know that, hey, it's going to be okay, whatever they're going through, because that, that was big. The reason why I always drink is I always felt like I was always going through something. Let me drink just to numb myself. And I really felt that that's a very important part is really taking care of yourself. So they were on the right track, taking care of themselves. But when I say you, when you're taking care of yourselves, going out for that self-care, getting your nails done, man, man, uh, massage, manicure, pedicure, whatever, it's how are you talking to yourself during that time? Are you getting your massage and you're thinking, oh, they're touching me, my legs feel fat? <laughs> or are you saying, you know, Gina, this is wonderful. You know, this, this is what you need. Your body needs this relaxation, taking time to step away, pausing from your busy life and just to enjoy the moment at this time. And it's very important to be present. Being present is very important. So with the mind, body and spirit, with the mind, I would really love to focus on communication skills, mindset practices that you can go ahead and utilize um, every day. And just to have better relationships with everybody, whether it's your family or your friends or even your spouse or boyfriend. And then um, I really focus on then the body because of course I'm a body worker. <laughs> 
And I was also a weight loss consultant for many years. Um, okay. Lots of like, like stretching, breathing exercises. So that way you're again, staying in the present moment. And then you have more clarity after you breathe. When you have like a breathing session, oh my goodness, it changes the world. This one particular one I love is called hypno breath work. And it's a guided breath work, um, kind of like a meditation as well, where you're doing mm -hmm. a breathing in through the belly, in through the chest and out through the mouth, like, you know, but slowly at your pace, you know, and then, um, when and then the 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 person is speaking and saying you know talking about your goals what you want it really makes a big big difference in your life and that's something that i love to do and of course the spirit like like i said the go on forever about this <laughs> the spirit the spirit you as a spiritual being is like magnificent and i always have this exercise where if you can envision your higher self um, speaking to women, because I work with women, uh, what is she, what is she doing? Who is she hanging around with? You know, who is, how is she speaking? What is she eating? What kind of activities is she doing? Is she smiling? You know, like, what is she thinking? What are her thoughts like? Because if you envision that in your head, it's already there. You're already that. <laughs> so I don't know. There's just so many different tools I can go on forever about. It. I get so passionate and so excited about talking about these things. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. Um, tell me about your shine process. That's exactly what that is. <laughs> so yeah, so shine is an acronym. Um, <laughs> and it is, well, again, bo mind, body, and spirit. So shine is yes. sobriety, healing. We also have inspiration. <laughs> we have nurturing and then empowerment. All of those combined together, you will definitely shine. Uh, one of my things, because of course us coaches have, have, coaches as well. So I've had my mindset coach. Uh, that was who I sought first because there was no recovery coach. There was no um, sobriety coach when I was in my recovery. So I sought out a mindset physical activity coach because I love to exercise. And she really helped me in my mindset, but she'd always say this to me, keep shining, keep shining. <laughs> Keep shining, Gina. <laughs> so shine was stuck to me, and it was it's it's dear in my heart, and so that's why I have the shine process. And it is a process. It's not going to be like overnight, you know. It's going to take some time, but that's the beauty of it. You get to experience and enjoy this journey in the process of learning who you are and loving yourself. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's great to have a process that is reliable as well. And I'm assuming you use this process in the coaching sessions that you run with people. Yeah. So I do have a one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, for six months. And then I also have what's a jam-packed VIP day where it's like a four-hour immersive where we focus on whatever you want to focus on. What what are your challenges? Does it have to do with, you know, mindset? Does it have to do with, you know, your body and getting better shape and feeling better about yourself? Or is it because you want to focus more on the spiritual aspects? what is it that you want to do? And so we, what we, when I say we, it's like me and my spirit because <laughs> I'm being guided, right? So what I do is I actually have a, like a toolkit that I create for them um, with whatever challenges they're having. I have the solutions because if there's anything that I was, I was taught from my mentor, she told me there's always a solution, no matter what the problem or what the issue is, whatever the deal is, there is always a solution. So I will, create a solution for you if you feel like there is none. Nice. I like, I, I like the, the idea of referring to your spiritual self and yourself as we, as a, <laughs> a, a you're not alone, right? You're not alone. That's the key. Right. <laughs> and hey, so have you ever watched the never ending story? This is totally like side, oh, side, uh, side oh, track. Like, do you remember the never ending I story? So much. Oh, I interviewed one of the actresses story. who was in it. Like three days oh, ago. Um, what's her name? I, I know her name too. Uh, she was in Bert. the number two. Clarissa Burke. Clarissa <laughs> Burke. Yeah, she was on She's my podcast. So awesome. She's on my other podcast. She's so awesome. So tell me, Never Ending Story, one of my favorite movies yes. of all time. That is my favorite movie of all time too. So, yeah. okay. Remember uh, Morla, the, the ancient turtles? <laughs> Yes. And then she refers or she refers to as we, we haven't spoken to humans yes. in thousands of years. Now I know where she gets the we from. <laughs> her and herself. We. Yes. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. I just thought I'd say that. It was funny. <laughs> no, I love it. It's such a, it's such a nice reference. <laughs> I, I mean, I spoke to Clarissa about that movie being really transformative for a whole generation of kids because before that, 
that concept of self-development, the hero's journey, all of that kind of stuff, I, you know, you're exposed to what? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and, and, and nonsense. And then suddenly there's this movie about a journey and there are setbacks and there's adversity, but you gather a few friends along the way and off you go. And I don't know, I, I think it was just a story of hope, which was perfectly timed for me anyway. Oh, I know. And then using the imagination so often as adults, yeah. we don't know, we don't use our imagination anymore. And as kids, yeah. you know, the sticks were our swords, Barbies were our best friends and they were alive. <laughs> So, yes. you know, everything was just so much fun as a child. And that's why I always have my inner child come out. I'm he the healed inner child. I mean, every day I'm growing. So <laughs> I won't say I'm done growing. No, every day I'm growing. But I feel mm. healed as from the trauma that I experienced. So that inner child comes out more so now as an adult because I didn't get the chance to really experience what it was like yes. to be a child between, you know, the ages of like 6 to 12. It was very different for me, but so now I'm enjoying it so much now. That's amazing. Do you think young women are suffering at the moment? And I say that because in the work we do at the Resilience Institute, which is um, an organization where I'm a partner globally, uh, we found that people with the lowest levels of resilience right now are young females in the age group of 20 to 29. And, and that's really, it's, it's a real concern to think that so many of them are suffering and potentially relying on alcohol and drugs and social media rather than being out there in the world. Do, do you see this as an issue? You know, I do see a lot of uh, young women suffering. Um, why? Why? Is because they don't have... They're not shining. They're just, you know, they're doing their everyday, you know, routine, you know, nine to five. Um, they're going out maybe to the gym a couple times, you know, but they're not really living. So an example of what really like living is, okay, someone could be just driving a car, just driving from A to B. Or are you driving? Are you rolling down that window? Are you having that hair fly, <laughs> you know, with the wind blowing against your, your face? Are you blasting your favorite song and dancing inside your car to it? Are you enjoy, enjoying your ride? So there's differences that I notice in a lot of young women. They're just not happy. They're not smiling. <laughs> that's, they're not smiling. They're, they're too afraid to speak up um, they're, or they're, they don't like themselves. And really what my goal is to really show them like, hey, just look at you. Like, what, what is something that you love about yourself? Name a couple of things, you know, or they feel like they can't get through anything in life. And it's like, well, hey, take a look about, about all the things that you've overcome in your past. What makes you think you can't overcome whatever you're going through now? <laughs> at all you know so it's like they don't have that self-belief and i really i really i really wish that they knew who they truly are as a spiritual being and the potential they have you know and i'm thinking back back to the never-ending story like you know <laughs> the potential you have because you're young sebastian even though he's a boy <laughs> riding that dragon that he was reading about you know the luck dragon and he probably thought he would never do that but sure enough he's doing it so you just never know you mentioned the challenges of motherhood uh, mixed with alcoholism. Um, tell me about balancing motherhood and recovery. Oh, so, so I didn't have both of my children at the time of my recovery. I would say the first year of my recovery. And then I had to fight for them. At least I had one of the oldest one because unfortunately his father went the other way, going downhill completely where then he's like, I cannot take care of him. So I actually have my son full time. And then he does have relationships with his dad. But I mean, that's another story that they I mean, he's old enough to talk to his dad about certain things now that they do their own thing. But with the youngest, I had to fight in court, you know, and I don't know if I shared this with you, but I wound up getting remarried in 2020, 2020, because I met my my husband at the time, which I, but I did not want to date anybody um, <laughs> during recovery, and I didn't think I was ready. I was already like four years into my sobriety, like three or four years of my sobriety, and I was like, I don't want to date nobody. But I guess 
God, the universe had different plans for me because they brought in, brought into this man in my life because I was taking care of his child during uh, children's ministry at church. And then we were on different, and then his, the dad and I were on different teams in street ministry. And so it's like, it kind of like all worked out. And then he had asked me like, Hey, I see that you have a son around same, same age as mine. Maybe we can go get ahead and get the kids together. But then we started conversing and we never really got the kids together. We just had like coffee and I shared my story. I was very vulnerable because he wanted to know like, Hey, how did, how did uh, you come into going to church here? What's going on? And then I shared and we had similar interests and sim similarities in our, in his past. And it just worked out. And I'm telling you, like he has a child now. Um, I mean, cause he was divorced also. And this family unit that we have now is it's blended, <laughs> but it's incredible. So now that I'm, I did, like I said, I didn't have my children with me during like the first couple of years of my recovery. I really had to focus on myself, but when I got, was getting better and better and better. I mean, what great practices I'm teaching my children when it comes to mindfulness, when it comes to even breathing exercises, we do it as a family. I mean, we just put in all of these healthy practices inside the household and we enjoy each other's company and we enjoy going out in nature walks. We just enjoy life as a family. And I'm going to tell you so much being sober in, in, in the marriage now <laughs> than looking back but before is so much better. And like, I, like a complete 360, like completely, I'm just blown away. I'm just amazed, but just amazed by, by everything. This world blows my mind now. <laughs> mm -hmm. What about the power of storytelling? Oh yes. I love power of storytelling. <laughs> So if I uh, mentioned to you before about when I was vulnerable and had to share my story um, in that two minute video, and then that's, that story is what got me to have a scholarship. And I'm, I feel like when you tell your story and other people hear it, that's why I also love podcasts too, because if we can tell this, the other person can relate to it and they don't feel alone and then they get more hope then they feel more inspired, then they feel more encouraged, and then they want to take action because they're like, you know what? If she can do it, I can do it too, you know? <laughs> and so I, the power of storytelling is so important because you really bring out your vulnerability. And then this is where you can start becoming your authentic self. When you are your authentic self, you are in your power because this is you. You're not you know, sugarcoating, you're not pretending, you're not be, you're not the conditioned person that the world has created. You are yourself and you really have to take a look at, you're not a mistake. Like, obviously you're created by the, 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 the high divine here. <laughs> so there's no mistake. And so just to, for us to break free from this um, conditioned mind that we have and what we've learned growing up in schools and TV and everything, politics, with the government, I can go on with that stuff too. That's another podcast. Um, you really start becoming your, your true self and then, then you can share your story to somebody. It can create an impact and it's just like a big ripple effect around the world. Mm. How can people tell better stories? Do you think it's a case of first taking the time to reflect and introspect and write down the story that they were telling themselves or maybe the real story and then rewriting a future story? Or do you have any tips for actually telling that story about yourself? You know, what's so interesting is that right now I'm in the process of writing a book, like a memoir, like of my story. And then one lady gave me the idea. She says, you know what? When you get stuck, because I've been stuck, right? For like three months, I haven't touched it. I was <laughs> just like, I haven't touched it because I got so occupied with other stuff. She says, go on to like, even like a Zoom video, record yourself telling the story. <laughs> you know, just kind of like do a big vomit. <laughs> Sorry. Mm. And just kind of like let it out, whatever you're feeling. And some people would prefer it just to write, handwrite it in like a journal, and that's fine. Or some people would prefer to go ahead and, like I said, do it on video. Um, whatever is good for you, I would just go ahead and say, just do it. Just start just using started. your creative mind and just put it out there. Who cares about like 
punctuation and like grammar who cares just even like a recorder like a one of those tape recorders just mm -hmm. say it yeah yeah so therapeutic yeah, for sure it is it is i found using voice notes on my phone just to be a really powerful yeah. tool and in fact i ended up writing a whole fiction novel using voice notes because it enabled me to go walking and while it was an autobiographical fiction novel, um, and what a wonderful process, just speaking. And then I found a lady in the Philippines who was happy to transcribe it. Now you can probably use an AI tool for that. And yeah, uh, it really, it's an amazing process just to put your thoughts down in whatever format they, they flow. That is so neat. So you actually yeah. use it. Oh, that is cool. I love that. See, like, just like that, yeah. too. There's another example that you just did, Brad. It's like, awesome. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, I would love to hear a little bit about um, life after addiction. So there are the highs, and those highs can be pretty intense. And of course, quite addictive. I mean, hey, I, I was part of the rave culture in the 90s. <laughs> It was amazing. <laughs> All love, yeah, right? <laughs> um, and I still look back at videos. They pop up on my Instagram feed and they're hilarious of young people mm. doing what I did. Um, you know, life afterwards is not necessarily peaking with such highs, but it's also not experiencing such lows, which I, I think are is a good thing you have more equilibrium but maybe i'm wrong i'd love to hear your, your your thoughts and particularly for someone out there who's saying actually i want to change um what shall i do what's life after addiction like well life after addiction yes and everybody's journey is different so it just depends on the individual so for my personal experience it was hard in the beginning like i said my goal my the end goal in mind was to be sober so I kept that in my head and as many times as I relapsed and hiccuped, I still never gave up. I was very persistent. It's like the three P's of manifestation. What is it? Persistence, patience, and perseverance. <laughs> mm. So having those three P's, I just never gave up. And yes, you're going to lose friends. Yes, I mean, you're going to have those low moments where you feel like you are by yourself. But those are the times where you then want to discover who you are and then start hanging around with the people who you want to become. So if you're maybe questioning the drink, saying, you know, I really want to drink right now, um, ask yourself, is this, is, if I have this drink, is this aligned to the person who I want to become in the future? And if it doesn't, you know, at least give yourself 24 hours to then make to make that final decision if you're going to drink or not. But give yourself some grace. And then if you are beating yourself up, just pause, take a deep breath and just give yourself some grace and compassion and say, you know what, you're on the right track. You're still you're you, you won't give up. <laughs> So you are going to have your highs and you are going to have your lows, um, but just surround yourself with people who are uplifting and are um, on the same goals as you are, are on the same track as you are or where you want to be. So for me, for example, it was all about the church. Okay. Not, <laughs> and mind you, like, I don't, I'm not like saying you must go to church in order for you to <laughs> go things find what's best for you whether it's different parts of a communities but community i think is always good to have because you want to mm. surround yourself with people that are like-minded for me for example like a mom group when i first had my son when he was born my friends were not like moms yet <laughs> they weren't even married yet um so i had to go to find on meetup.com like a mom group and i still have like really good relations with those women from 16 years ago <laughs> so yeah mm. Find a good group so of, just uh, uh, women or you men. just need to mm -hmm. you need to put yourself in uncomfortable situations i mean it is uh, to to join a meetup group it's the unknown you you don't mm -hmm. know if they all know each other already especially people who maybe suffer from a little bit of social anxiety it's any tips for that or just just go for it just relax yourself and just do it lean in Lean in, you know, it, this world is not that serious. <laughs> Have fun. We're only here for a little bit of time. 
<laughs> so why don't yes. you make the best of it? You know, we're only here for a short amount of time. Let's enjoy, let's embrace and like, let's come together and have fun. You know, like I always say, if, if you're not having fun, whatever you're doing, then you're not doing it right. <laughs> have fun. Mm. Well, what is, what are some of the things that give you the most joy in, in your life? And perhaps you could also share a little bit about your shine podcast, which I'm sure is one of those things. Yeah. Oh, my baby. <laughs> so what I enjoy in life is I love being with my children and my family. And what we, I, what brings me the most joy is seeing them have joy and seeing them evolve and grow up into, you know, these beautiful, bright beings that they are. And um, noticing like even my communication with them is, is different. Like I, like, when I was communicating, when, it, when my mom was communicating with me when I was little, it was completely different to how I'm communicating with my children. Like, I won't say, why are you crying? Stop crying. I was like, hey, let's talk about it. Like, what's, what's going on? You know, it's totally normal to cry. I'd let release it, you know, <laughs> cry it out. <laughs> it's a good thing. You know, it's part of, it's therapeutic. Um, but it's just the way we communicate. And then nature, nature is a big, big thing that brings me so much joy. I love my nature walks. I love being out there and I love serving. Serving, I think also brings me the most joy. So those three things, nature, family, and a serving. That's oh, and yeah, my those podcast. Three. <laughs> and your podcast, of course. But those three <laughs> things, I, I, I think they're missing from a lot of people's lives. The, the mm -hmm. nature part, particularly, and and serving you know just being of service it sounds like that's been a huge part of your journey is that shift to well it's not just about me actually it's about we and empowering women to to recover and that gives you that sense of purpose which is so powerful in terms of guiding you along the path oh yes yes and that's what you know uh, the podcast you know just came to me like i said i'm being divinely guided like did i ever okay first off i was always fearful of like talking like i don't i'm not a public speaker i'm not any of that <laughs> but you know i'm like i'm gonna do it because i'm i i feel like i'm supposed to so why not and so i i i did and what i love is i'm meeting all these women that are sharing their story, being vulnerable, sharing their their expertise in like health, you know, women's health and spirituality and also mindset. And I just really want it to reflect love, really. <laughs> and so women who are because majority I have 90% of my audience is women. Very few percent in men, because it is part of my niche, you know, tying back to you know, working with women. But I'm noticing that I am just People will tell me, I love your podcast show. I love, you know, your speaker for the day. She brought, she, she made me change my perspective. I love hearing these testimonials and it, it makes me just want to continue and do more and more and more. Mm, you're great at conversation. I've really enjoyed this one. And oh, I think <laughs> being able to extract wisdom from people who might not share it otherwise that's part of my purpose i love it so much just getting to chat to people like you and so many other amazing individuals who you know they share these tips and tools and um, case studies real life experience of how they actually managed to do whatever it was that was important to them so it's wonderful that you're actually out there having those conversations coaching people, taking people through your workshop. Um, for people who are interested in connecting, maybe attending, maybe coaching, how can they get in touch with you? Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So GinaCunadian.com. It's G-I-N-A-K-U-N-A-D-I-A-N.com. And I actually have a gift for your your listeners. I actually have um, what's called, it's my six-step blueprint to living an alcohol-free life. It's the steps that I've taken that I embraced during my sobriety journey without AA. <laughs> AA did not work for me, but by all means, if AA is working for you, please tend. Do what's best for you. But but because it didn't work out for me, I created something that I use for myself that has helped me tremendously. And I want to go ahead and give it to your to your audience. It is on my website. And I think I may have shared a link with you as well. 
You did, you did. Oh, perfect. I'll make sure that that's in the show notes as well as a link to your website and your social media channels so people can follow follow your work and follow your journey. It's really inspiring. Thank you for for sharing that, you know, especially when you've experienced childhood trauma. It can be a difficult thing to overcome. And I think the scars always remain. It reminds me of the concept of kintsugi. Have you heard of kintsugi? It's, I heard, but I, you may just need to refresh my memory. <laughs> it sounds yeah, familiar. It's, it's, it's the art of uh, repairing broken vases and so forth in Japan. Oh, you know, yes. so a broken vase, sometimes we see ourselves as a broken vessel, but they repair it using uh, melted gold. And the end wow. product is so much stronger and more beautiful than it was uh, previously. So uh, your journey reminds me of something like that. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Brad. I appreciate that. Any final words of wisdom, advice, uh, final thoughts for our listeners? Well, I want to say thank you so much again for having this platform. It's amazing that you bring us on here and so we can share our experiences with others and hopefully it does resonate to your listeners. Um, but I, I, I just want to say for those who are struggling with alcohol or any addiction, any addiction, just know that Seeking for help is not going to lessen you as a person. When you ask for help, it's actually a sign of strength. So get the help that you need in any way that was, works for you. You know, whether it's a coach, whether it's going to AA, whether it's just even talking to somebody about what you're going through, just asking for help is going to help so much. So that's what I wanted to say. Gina, thank you so much. And thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you in the next episode. See you. Thank you.